we're thrilled to have one of my favorite humans. And uh, it's it's truly uh, one of the best things about that hellscape called Twitter now X is I got to meet this guy essentially through it and then be able to call him a friend. And I love looking down and seeing a text from him whenever uh, he wants to reach out and thrilled to lend this platform like so many others to help this man sell books. It's hard for me to live with me a new memoir available now wherever you get your books from the great Rex Chapman. How are you, Rex? Rich, thanks for having me, buddy. I'm doing well. How about you? Uh, recovered, better, from the, recovered from the combine? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting on my ass for four straight days just saying, <laughs> look at that guy run. Uh, it's... <laughs> Yeah, and you reached out during the combine. I love, I love seeing you, man, uh, yeah, on you my uh, on my phone, uh, and now on my screen right here on this show. Congrats on all the outpouring of uh, support about your book, Rex. It's wild. It really is wild. And I, I'm going to try. I I was on Dan, your buddy Dan Patrick's show uh, earlier, and yep. you guys are my friend. And I got a little too comfortable on Dan's show and ended up cussing a couple of times. So <laughs> I'll try to not do no. that today. We have a you. button here, Rex. Uh, Jason okay. Feller is now on notice. It's very <laughs> rare to get a guest on notice to say, get ready uh, and get ready to hit the button. So uh, he's, he's got he's got it ready. Um, but uh, so let's let's start with the why. Why did you uh, write it, Rex? Oof. With- uh, you know, I don't know that I would have. Uh, Seth Davis called me about, it's been about four years ago now and just out of nowhere, um, asked me if, you know, I would keep, he had seen me on something talking about opioids and I think talking about, uh, oh, I talking about George Floyd's murder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know. He called me and said, you ready to change the world? I didn't really know what he meant, but, uh, I said, sure. What do you, what do you, what do you mean? And uh, he ran it by me and we started talking about it. And it was right as the pandemic started. So we were talking a lot on the phone during the days and, you know, kind of hammered out a, uh, a proposal and sent it out. And Simon and Schuster loved it and uh, wanted to do it. But then it, the hard part starts and you have to really dig in. And um, the hardest part, I, I did it for my kids. I did it for my kids and hopefully that, uh, you know, they can see a different me. I was a drug addict for, uh, you know, when, when I got arrested in 2014, my oldest, our oldest was 20 and our youngest was probably 11 or 12. And, uh, you know, that's college age and middle school age. I'm all over the papers, all over the news for being arrested, a drug addict, um, I remember sitting in rehab and thinking, look, if I'm going to live, then I need to really try to figure out what's wrong with me and why I do the things that I do and uh, and really try. So I did. I buckled down and started really digging into to my life and the decisions and choices I've made. And therapy, I think, probably saved my life. Well, you know, and I think just uh, starting – here is that starting off point, Rex. I think you're kind of hitting um, right on the head what I'm sure you must hear from so many others who have family members who have gone through what you're describing or people who are the ones going through what you're describing is that um, the, the addiction is something you need to face and the choices that you may make um, for something that does feel like you're – you have no control over it, right? And realizing yeah. that you, that there is some control you can exert yeah. and that choices need to be made and there is some sort of sense of responsibility you have to yeah. take as opposed to saying all of these circumstances in my life have caused me right. to do this sort of thing. And exactly. finding that moment without having to hit rock bottom might be the whole, you know, key to yeah. helping others, how what 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 do you say to those who are searching for that, Rex? <laughs> Man, I, I I swear, and I I hate to do this again, but I mentioned it in the book. A good friend of mine, Rick Patino, came to see me. Pride is a hell of a thing, and and Rick came to see me in rehab, and I was a bawling mess. He and his assistant Vinny Tatum, both lifelong friends of mine, and I was crying, toxic, telling them I'm toxic. Uh, I was 
they could probably barely understand me. Rick finally said, listen, look at me. And he said, you're going to eat a lot of mm. crap for a while. He said, at first, it's going to be a big beach ball sized ball of crap. And mm. he said, if you do the next right thing, slowly but surely, that beach ball will turn into a, a, a basketball. And do the next right thing, it'll turn into a volleyball, and then a softball, tennis ball, golf ball, ping pong ball, marble, pebble. And that won't be the first thing people think about you anymore, but it's going to take some what take some time and you're going to eat some stuff. And this has come from a guy who's been through some stuff. So for whatever reason, I latched onto that. And when you're, when you're at rock bottom and my friends said, my, many of my close friends said, Rex, man, we didn't want to see you arrested. We didn't want this to happen to you, but something had to happen because you were going to die you were going to die. And they're right. You know, you can't just eat 40, 50 pills a day with no water for years and, and think that you're going to be okay or take, you know, a medicine that's supposed to wean you off of opioids for 10 years and think that's going to be okay. Just a lot of crazy thinking and, you know, really feeling bad about myself as a person and uh, digging into that and, you know, you know, realize slowly but surely started, you know, to see that what Rick was saying was true. And, uh, you know, it, here I am. The other thing about the book, I've gotten such an outpouring from people, you know, on Twitter, text messages, phone calls from so many people. And it makes me feel, feel really good. This is just on a bigger scale. I've been speaking and doing this stuff. You know, I have, yes. I talk about freely and openly. And if anybody, family member, friend has a problem, you know, anybody, you can put them in touch with me to call. This is just, this book has been on a bigger scale. And I, I get stories from people all day long that I read and I try to respond to about my brother had an issue. My uncle, my dad died from alcoholism. Uh, we, I've always had mental illness, the anxiety in my People struggle, man. Life is hard. And and I hope that this is hitting a chord. Really, I just wanted to do it for my children and for anyone else, you know, struggling with addiction. And if people get something out of it, great. Because it's been kind of hell living it. <laughs> well, I mean, in terms of that, Rex Chapman here, It's Hard for Me to Live With Me is a book everyone should get available wherever you get your books right now. Um, you know, um, writing a book, the toughest thing anyone will ever tell you about writing a book, even oh. though you had help of such a, a terrific writer in Seth Davis, uh, is selling it <laughs> and getting out there. No, seriously, it's, it, it's, that's the tough, the tough part is, is, is when the book comes out and, and selling it. Um, you know, I have nothing. I have no idea what any of this is. Uh, thank you, Rich. Go ahead. Finish that. No, uh, but 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 in selling it, you got to You got to have this conversation. It seems over and over and over again. And it, it comes across from me. And I know differently, though, is you're so free it, talking about it. But I'll see sometimes you tweeting out like that was tough. That yeah. was tough that you had to go through that conversation. So um, do you have to steal yourself up for even conversations like this? Yes, Rex? definitely. Uh, yes, definitely. And it's gotten better, markedly better over the past week since I That's had good. to do it. Seth was a rock star, is a rock star, you know, he, and he did all the heavy lifting. I'm bar barely literate. So um, he, it, the best thing he did was right at the beginning, he said, listen, man, we're going to talk about some hard stuff. No shame ever. I'm not judging you for anything. He said that <laughs> He probably said it 50 times while we're doing it because I had to tell him the worst parts about my life. Some of it we didn't use. Um, but I will say this. When I was in college and unrelated to basketball, I had a panic attack and it's detailed in the book. I didn't know. I'd never heard the term panic attack and didn't know that's what it was. And probably until two years ago, uh, I felt like I needed to go to the hospital I ended up getting out of uh, getting over it in a couple of days and I forgot about it, completely forgot about it until we were writing this book. <laughs> and about six months ago when we were wrapping up the book, Rich, I had another one. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, my girlfriend was there and Whitney Lawson and she. Man, she took great care of me for a couple of days and I snapped out of it, but I don't know how to explain 
explain it except I remember as a kid hearing people say, well, she had a nervous breakdown, you know, that's what I felt like. I feel like nothing matters. I feel hot. I can't really move my arms and breathing is tight. My chest is tight. It's happened only twice in my whole life. And it's due to, you know, some of the stuff that I had to, or I felt like I had to include in the book for it to be authentic and, and honest. And then of the people, the many people I saw this one and I saw your reaction to it too, you know, LeBron putting up, uh, you know, congratulating you on the book and how it's awesome for you to be able to overcome your shortcomings and obstacles life put in front of you, true leader and King definitely supporting and ordering your book. And then two days later, there he is holding up your book and pointing to it. I mean, come on. This is wild. I don't, I don't even know what to think. I, I'm going to reveal this. Uh, I don't know LeBron that well. We know each other, obviously. Every, and he only knows me from highlights. And he's a basketball historian. Every time that dude sees me. And the first time I met him was fresh out of rehab. And I think he knew it. And he came up and said, sexy Rexy. He says it every time and hugs me gives me big love. I saw him in Phoenix a couple of weeks ago at the Suns Lakers game. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time I've seen him since uh, Bronny had his heart issue last year, his son. And uh, he gave me the same love, came up to me and I just pulled him aside for a second. And I said, Hey man, I'm really, really excited about Bronny getting back out there. And I let him know that I know people People have their opinions on Bronny. I'm a Bronny James fan. I've watched him grow up, and I've watched him play against Reed Shepard, Jeff Shepard's son, who plays at Kentucky. They've been playing against each other since they're 12. In my opinion, they're both longtime pros in the NBA. And I'd pass that along to to uh, LeBron. And, you know, that's that's his baby, man. It's his oldest baby. He and his wife been through it. Their son's heart stop in college. I can't imagine anything more terrifying. So I told him that, and then here we are. I, I released the book a week later, and he just does this on his own. Huh. What a guy. What a guy. Man. I'm glad you told the backstory because uh, I, I even thought, okay, you know, book comes out, you pull every string you can to help no. s promote it or anything. He did that on his, on his own. Lonesome. Lonesome. On, on his own, yes. Okay. You got the book. I've had, he, he took I've had everybody reach out. Stephen Curry. Of course, Stephen's in the book. He's my little buddy. But right. I've, Kevin Durant, uh, you name it. Everybody that you can think of has just, and I, because honestly, Seth, I, or Seth, <laughs> there I go, Rich, I, I've been preparing myself for people to just hate me and hate the book. And also, the book is selling, and I feel like the, the first year trainer, first year owner of a like a, a thoroughbred horse who goes to the Kentucky Derby. I have and there's people been in the book business forever that, you know, they look to sell a book. And I just wrote this with Seth, hoping that a few people might but mainly my, my my parents, my kids, my ex-wife, um, and my friends. And their kids could feel proud of me again, at least in some small way. So I, I'm re very heartened about the book. Well, I, I I will just say this to anybody out there who, who's listening and and watching right now, and I I will say this, especially since this show is frequently on the air on a lot of news talk stations, and people who might not have the same, um, what well, what would you say? I guess. Um, political, cultural opinions as you, okay? Right. But, and, and that's part of what's also, you know, upsetting about this country is you have a political discussion and it'll eventually turn personal for a lot of people, demonizing right. one side instead of, and, and sometimes sports, which should be the great connector, that, yeah. even, gets, that even gets pulled into it, right? Right. right. Um, the bottom line is what you're talking about knows no political boundaries, 0.0 yeah. .0 political boundaries. What you are talking about, everybody knows somebody who's gone through it. So I would I would counsel to say, even if they think, oh, God, here's Rex, yeah. um, th they should listen and listen yeah. to your story, brother. Said, uh, Rich, I, I couldn't agree anymore. Uh, you know, I, earlier someone said to me, 
or yesterday, I forget when it was, it's all running together. Someone said, well, look, Rex, you know, you got to cut yourself a break. You know, you had all those surgeries your last few years and you came by this problem, honestly. I, that doesn't matter. I understand what the person is saying. The issue is once you're there, you're there. It doesn't matter how you get there. I got there because, yeah, I had some injuries. and But also, I may have come across that anyway if I found out it could numb my feelings and all of that. Um, or it doesn't matter if you go out on a three-weekend, three-day bender on the weekend and, you know, you you party all weekend and now you, you're addicted. What happens now? What happens? You're, you're there and you got to get out. It doesn't matter how you got there. You just got to find a way to dig yourself out. And I can't recommend therapy any more than I already have. And I can't recommend opening up to friends, close friends, uh, leaning into people, have somebody around you that goes, how are you doing, man? No, really, how are you doing? I would never answer those questions. I'd deflect and make a joke and just get out of an awkward situation. I could never admit that I wasn't okay. And it's okay to admit that. Well, uh, before I let you go, um, tell me your favorite basketball story in the book. That because <laughs> uh, because obviously you know this is a memoir, um, yeah. and you're filled with those, you yeah. know, and all the LeBron haters out there are thinking maybe he bought your book and posted it so you'd stop saying Jordan's the best player of all time, <laughs> you know. But uh, you, well, I have to say that because I was better than Michael one night. So that, <laughs> I was the best player in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were, Rex. So w- what's a good story? Because folks can get this book also if they're interested in some of your, your hoops stories. Yeah, well, too, I don't know if it's my favorite story, okay. but it is a story. Okay. Uh, I got in trouble a lot growing up. I pushed the boundaries, and mainly because I, I think I knew I could get away with things because they couldn't afford to sit me out and uh, on the basketball floor. Nice. One time as a junior, I was probably the most, I was probably the best player in the state. And we had been playing a team that really uh, challenged us and um, jump ball. And side note, my future, it was my future father-in-law's team we're playing against. So (laughs) this kid on his team, who he always put on me, really good athlete, white kid, Todd Arms is his name, and I've apologized to Todd Arms a million times over this. Todd, I'm sorry. So, Todd, I went up to shoot a ball, beginning, first play of the game, and he turned around and boxed me out before I came down and undercut me, and we I landed on the ground. Come down again, he did the same damn thing, and I pulled him down on top of me so the trans play could run, the referees would get up the court. We both got up, and... We're jogging back, and I look around, and there's 6,000 people in the stands. Mm. And I elbowed Todd Arms in the nose, cracked him as we're running back down the court, and his face exploded, blood everywhere. Like, I've never seen so much blood. Their teammates started running at me. My teammates started getting in the way. There was a big sort of melee. The referees didn't see what happened. I ended up getting a technical and had that – video been on had that game been on video there's a high probability i'd have never played in college it was bad like it 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 was bad bad Mm. and uh, you know i had i'm so stupid they called me in the next day and said you need to call their their coach who was my (laughs) became my (laughs) father-in-law wow (laughs) and apologized uh you need to call todd arms and apologize i and i said what did you see what he did to me Mm. like an idiot? Mm -hmm. So, but I did call, I did apologize and I've apologized so much, so many times over the years. There are funny stories in the book. There are funny basketball stories. I thought that one was, uh, I thought that I wasn't all I was cracked up to be. I had some real issues emotionally, uh, that, always needed tackling i'm glad i finally tackled him yeah in a book again it's hard for me to to live with me okay then then let's finish up with the story you just kind of alluded to for those who may not know the night you were better than jordan best player in the world what was that which night which night was that oh <laughs> 
You got one? Is it one night? One uh, night? What do you got? No, Rex? no, no, no. No, that. Oh, what did you want? You wanted me to talk about that night? Yeah, the, sure. Yeah. Against the Bulls? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were, we had eight players because we just made a trade for Tim Hardaway. We were sending out Billy Owens and getting Timmy back, and mm-hmm. there were players in transit. And so we played the, we had to play the Bulls, who they only lost 10 games that whole year. We had to play the Bulls and, Miami came into town and they were out all night long on South Beach at South Beach. And I know that because I was there part of the night. <laughs> <laughs> but I went home early and uh, they came out. They, it was they they really were on vacation, I promise. And w- I got hot. And as Jimmy Lynham used to say, a former teammate of mine, or a coach of mine, when you let a player in this league get going, you got yourself an effing problem. So um, I got going, and there was nothing that them or anyone else could have done that night. Um, it was uh, it was a great win for us. Um, fantastic. And a couple weeks later, we played them, and we went out for the jump ball and threw the, the referee threw the ball up, and Michael 39. elbowed he elbowed me right in the sternum michael did mm. intentionally and we're friends and i went oh oh man it's, it's gonna be like that tonight and it was he got like 40 and three quarters and didn't play the fourth he'd been thinking about that game for two weeks <sighs> and he and i know each other like we're friends friends he'd been thinking about that game for two weeks and thought i had embarrassed him or and embarrassed them which yeah, but probably did. But we ended up playing them in the playoffs, and they swept us in three games like a, like we were a JV team. It was no match. But, yeah, uh, we got them that one night, and they would have been 73-9 and nine if, if not for us. <laughs> You're a factor, Rex. What was the line, what was the line that night, Chris? Yeah, 39 for Rex, 9 of 10 from three, big boy. There you go. Yeah, let me tell you this. You might not know this. Who Who scored the most points in a game? against the, that 72 uh, and 10 team. Who's that? Me. <laughs> what was that? 39? 39. That 39. was it? Yeah. That's the yeah, most they, anybody scored that night was 30 uh, uh, all season. On that team that season, yes. So, of course, he elbowed you in the stomach two weeks later. <laughs> yeah. <man. laughs> yeah. I got everybody's attention after that. You did. Uh, and you have our attention with this book, brother. Love you. Congratulations on all of this. You are, you are truly awesome. And, and thank you for writing it and sharing it as freely as you have, Rex. Thanks, Rich. Love you much. Right back at you. At Rex Chapman. Follow him. Do all of that good stuff. At It's Hard for Me to Live With Me, co-written with Seth Davis, Rex Chapman, right here on The Rich Eisen Show. Take care, buddy. Catch The Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free. 